Chapter 47 A Nightingale's Desperate Flight The year was 1950. The morning after the debate in Houston, Texas, Fred Bosworth stopped by William Branham's hotel room to give him a letter. Mita peeked over her husband's shoulder. It's from Durban, South Africa. Open it, Bill. Bill unfolded the letter and began to read. This letter came from a private nurse of a woman named Florence Nightingale Sherlaw, who claimed to be a relative of the famous 19th century English nurse Florence Nightingale. Miss Sherlaw was dying with cancer and was begging Bill to fly to Durban, South Africa as quickly as possible to pray for her. She was too weak to come to America. The cancer had grown over the duodenum in her stomach, preventing her from digesting any food. Every day for months, a nurse fed her through a tube inserted in a vein. Slowly, she was wasting away. Her doctors did not expect her to live much longer. She needed a miracle from Jesus Christ. To punctuate her desperate situation, Miss Sherlaw enclosed a picture of herself. Mita gasped. Bill stared at the photograph in shocked silence. Never before had he seen a human being so emaciated. Her arms looked like broomsticks except for the bulge at each elbow joint. Bill could easily count her ribs. The poor woman looked like skin stretched over a skeleton. A copy of this photograph is on page 49 of the book William Branham, A Prophet Visits South Africa by Julius Stadsklef. Florence Nightingale Sherlaw included an airplane ticket along with her letter and picture. Bill looked at the ticket and then looked questioningly at his manager. Fred Bosworth knew what he was thinking. Brother Branham, there is no way you can fly to South Africa right now. You're due in Beaumont in a few days. Then you go to Pensacola, Florida. Then you've got several engagements in Arkansas. Then Carlsbad, New Mexico. You're booked solid in the States clear up to April when you leave for Europe. In May, after you get back from Scandinavia, you do have some unscheduled time. You could go then. Judging from the sound of her letter, Bill held up the photograph for another look. And from this picture, she'll probably be dead by May. Perhaps, agreed Bosworth, but Brother Branham, you get letters all the time from people on their deathbeds. You can't fly off to pray for every dying person who sends you an airplane ticket. If you did, that's all you'd be doing with your time. You've got to be led by the Spirit. That's just it, said Bill. The Spirit is telling me there is something significant about this woman. Maybe the Lord is calling me to South Africa. Bosworth didn't answer. Bill said, let's at least pray for Miss Sherlaw now. Laying the letter and her picture on the floor, they knelt around it and Bill prayed. Heavenly Father, when I saw the words Durban, South Africa on that letter, something leaped inside me. Do you want me to go to Durban and hold meetings? Father, here is a poor dying woman looking to you as her last hope for life. I'm asking you to heal Florence Nightingale Sherlaw in the name of your son, Jesus. And Lord, if you do heal her, I will take that as a sign from you that I should launch a healing campaign in South Africa. While preaching in Florida in February of 1950, Bill received a long-distance telephone call from Mrs. Reese. Her husband, an old friend of Bill's, had just suffered a stroke and was lying in a hospital bed at the point of death. All Bill could do was pray for his friend over the phone, asking God to have mercy. The next day, Mrs. Reese phoned back with the good news that during the night, her husband's condition improved. The doctors now seemed sure that he was going to live, Bill thanked the Lord for sparing his friend's life. In March, Bill held a campaign in Carlsbad, New Mexico. After one service, he saw Mr. Reese come out of the church. Bill walked over to say hello and was shocked to see how much his friend had aged since he had seen him last. One arm hung limp and useless. The other moved with unnatural difficulty. His wife and his chauffeur had to help him walk along. Brother Branham, he said his words slow and slurred. Last night my prayer card was so close. You called numbers 25 to 35 and mine was number 36. Oh, if I'd just been able to get in that prayer line. Brother Reist, just being in the prayer line wouldn't have healed you. I know, Brother Branham, but I want to know what I've done to deserve this. 
If I've done anything wrong, God knows that I'm sorry for it. I'm glad to be living, but why should I have to live through the rest of my life like this? Well, Brother Reese, I don't know why these things happen. In the meetings, I just pick a starting number at random to give everyone the same chance. If God would have intended it to be... That's all right, Brother Branham. It's not your fault. I'm going to follow your meetings and keep on trying until God shows me if I'm ever going to get well or not. Bill looked with pity on his decrepit friend standing on the sidewalk, dressed in a blue suit, white shirt, and red tie. Suddenly, Bill saw another Mr. Reese, wearing a brown suit, white shirt, and brown tie, standing under a palm tree, standing erect and strong, lifting both arms above his head and praising God. When the vision vanished, Bill said, Brother Reese, thus saith the Lord, you are going to be a well man. I don't know where, but I know it isn't here because there are no palm trees here. Someday you'll be standing by the side of a palm tree with a brown suit on and a white shirt with a brown tie. You are going to see me and then you'll be healed. Whether it's this year or next or ten years from now, I don't know. But remember, Brother Reese, it is thus saith the Lord. On April 6, 1950, William Branham, Ern Baxter, Jack Moore, Gordon Lindsay, and Howard Branham boarded an airplane bound for London, England. It seemed a fitting way for Bill to spend his 41st birthday, spreading his wings and soaring into a worldwide ministry. When his plane landed in London, Bill was surprised to see thousands of people waiting to greet him. He had no meetings scheduled in the British Isles, this was merely a stopover on his way to Finland so that he could pray for England's King George VI. As the Branham party struggled through the closely packed crowd, Bill heard his name paged over the airport loudspeaker. Reverend Baxter offered to see what it was all about. Ten minutes later, Ern Baxter returned with another surprise. Brother Branham, you're never going to believe this, but that woman from South Africa, Florence Nightingale Sherlaw, Somehow she learned you were going to be landing here today, so she decided to risk coming here herself in a last-ditch effort to have you pray for her in person. Her plane landed just minutes before ours. It's over there, and she's still on board. Ern Baxter pointed to a plane parked on the other side of the runway. Brother Branham, Miss Sherlaw wants you to come and pray for her immediately. She thinks she's dying right now. Bill studied the situation dubiously. There were thousands of people sandwiched between him and Florence Sherlaw's plane. Turning to one of the host ministers, an Anglican bishop, Bill suggested, Why don't you take Miss Sherlaw to your home? I'll go down to Buckingham Palace and pray for the king. Then later I'll go to your parsonage and pray for her. You can call me at the Piccadilly Hotel to arrange a time. But Brother Branham, the bishop protested, she may not live that long. Well, I can't get to her here. You can see by that crowd. The bishop nodded. All right, if that is the best we can do. You're right. You can't get through this crowd to her plane. The day's business took longer than Bill expected. King George VI was suffering from Bugger's disease, a painful type of arterial sclerosis which restricted the flow of blood to his feet and legs. After William Branham prayed for him, the king's condition improved so much that for the first time in months he could make public appearances. After praying for the king at Buckingham Palace, Bill's hosts took him to the historic home of John Wesley, the renowned 18th century evangelist who founded the Methodist Church. Bill knelt and prayed in the room where the great man himself prayed at five o'clock every morning that he was home. Then Bill put on Wesley's cloak, walked into his church, and stood behind his pulpit. Bill thought of how John Wesley had preached a message of sanctification, emphasizing that people should not only accept Jesus as their Savior, but they should also lead holy lives. He thought about how God had used John Wesley to spark a revival that had swept across England and had also fanned out to many other parts of the Christian world. Bill wondered what history would say about the revival now spreading out from his own ministry. Later that day, his host took Bill to Westminster Abbey, where a large group of ministers waited to meet him. They didn't get him back to the Piccadilly Hotel until 2 a.m. The next morning, a heavy fog hid the city. Bill and his party took a taxi to the bishop's address. 
He lived in a beautiful parsonage adjoining a large Anglican church. The bishop met them at the door and led them up a circular stairway to a second-story apartment. Bill's first sight of Florence Nightingale Sherla left him momentarily speechless. She lay in her back with a white sheet tucked around her sides, making her look like an Egyptian mummy. Her cheeks drooped like bowls. Her eyes had sunken deep into their sockets. Her mouth was so tightly drawn that Bill could see the shape of her teeth through her skin. The poor woman looked like she weighed around 50 pounds. But Bill remembered Georgie Carter, who had also withered down to 50 pounds before the Lord healed her of tuberculosis. Even Georgie had not looked as bad as this. Georgie Carter was a small woman. Florence Nightingale Sherlaw was almost six feet tall. A doctor stood near the doorway. Bill found his voice and asked quietly, Is there any chance for her? The doctor shook his head. Not a chance. She hasn't eaten solid food in two months. Now she's so thin that the veins in her arms and legs have collapsed and we can't get a needle in to feed her. Oh, that's too bad, Bill whispered. He walked over to the bed and said, How do you do, Miss Sherlaw? I'm Brother Branham. Her eyes fluttered open and her lips moved, but Bill could not make out her whisper. The nurse leaned over to listen, then said, Brother Branham, she wants to shake your hand. The nurse pulled her patient's hand out from underneath the bed sheet and placed it in Bill's. It felt as cold as death. The skin was stretched so tightly around her bones that Bill felt like he was holding the hand of a skeleton. Brother Branham, said the nurse, Florence has followed your ministry closely. She prayed so hard and long to see you, believing that if she could just get near you, Jesus Christ would heal her. But I'm afraid she's finally given up hope. I believe she'll die right away now, Brother Branham, because she wanted to see you before she died. Tears seeped from the corner of Miss Sherlaw's eyes as she mouthed a faint sentence. Bill wondered where she could find enough moisture to cry. She wants you to see her body, the nurse said. When they drew the sheets back, Bill felt another wave of sympathy mixed with nausea. Her arms and legs, which were no bigger than the bones, were streaked with the blue lines of her collapsed veins. Her breasts and stomach were sunken and her ribs stood out in stark detail. The skin even outlined the ring of the hip joint. She looked just like a living skeleton. Again, Florence moved her lips. The nurse bent low to pick up the sounds then repeated her patient's words, Have Brother Branham ask God to let me die. Bill felt his heart rip in two. Let's all pray, he said. Gordon Lindsay, Ern Baxter, Jack Moore, three English ministers, two nurses, and a doctor all gathered around Florence Shearlaw's bed. Bill prayed the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. As he prayed, a dove landed on the sill of an open window just behind and above his head. Restlessly, the dove paced back and forth, trilling, Hoo! Hoo! Coo! Finishing the Lord's Prayer, Bill continued, Almighty God, I pray that thy blessing may rest on this poor dying mortal. I can't ask for her death when she has prayed so hard for her life. Please be merciful to her, Father. I ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. The dove flew away. When Bill opened his eyes, he saw that the ministers had not been praying, but had been watching the bird. Did you notice that dove? one of them asked. Opening his mouth to say, I did, Bill was amazed to hear himself proclaim, Thus saith the Lord, This woman will live and not die. Every person in that room looked astonished. It seemed so utterly impossible. Brother Branham, are you sure? Ern Baxter questioned. This was not on my mind to say, replied Bill. It was not me that spoke. It was him. Therefore, it will come to pass. And when it does, it will stand as a sign that I am supposed to go to Durban, South Africa.